Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Ted Landsmark. I am Distinguished Professor of uh, Policy in uh, the Policy School here at Northeastern and Director of the Dukakis Center. Um, we welcome everyone back to the open portions of uh, the open classroom, which has uh, functioned in this space for about a decade. Um, this semester, uh, we are returning to a format that we've used in the past, wherein we are uh, bringing together uh, two university faculty, uh, my uh, colleague Jonathan Kaufman, who heads our journalism program, and myself. Um, and we are exploring the intersection of uh, media, uh, politics, and uh, public policy. Um, I, I think the title of the course is uh, somewhat more uh, provocative than that. But the goal is to uh, bring together uh, individuals who um, are uh, in newsrooms and uh, in the world of media, uh, working uh, to um, bring us uh, facts uh, in an authentic way, but also uh, working to uh, carry forward with ideas that uh, have the effect of um, uh, changing and transforming uh, public policies. Um, we are also uh, fortunate to have with us as a faculty member uh, this semester, Jill Abrams, whose uh, background uh, includes uh, many years uh, essentially running the news at the New York Times. Um, and uh, we have tonight with us a group of uh, journalists with uh, distinguished uh, credentials. Um, I'm not going to introduce all of them. In fact, they will uh, introduce themselves. But we welcome everyone back uh, to uh, this open forum. We remind folks uh, that uh, this is a space of open discourse. Uh, we want to hear from everyone. We will uh, provide uh, an opportunity for uh, an exchange of ideas uh, among ourselves. This is um, a safe space uh, to the extent that we want to hear from everyone uh, who is uh, here with us. Uh, and uh, with that as an introduction, I'm going to turn the microphone over to my colleague, Jonathan Kaufman. Jonathan, you're on. Great. Thank you, Ted. Um, so the title for this uh, program is The Media Landscape. We're going to be looking at the whole question of politics and media this semester, um, Jill Abramson, Ted Landsmark, and myself. And we're going to try to look at different issues um, that are becoming either political flashpoints or media flashpoints. So uh, we'll be posting a list of the topics and suggested readings, required readings for some of you, suggested for others, and for folks online to also uh, kind of follow along. We'll be looking at abortion and reproductive rights. Um, we'll be looking at the rise of Christian nationalism. We'll be looking at the courts and the kind of role that they're playing. Uh, we'll be looking next week at voters um, and, uh, and, uh, and later on at climate change and other issues. Um, but for today, tonight, the focus is on the media. And I'm just going to briefly introduce um, the, our guests. Uh, we've already started the discussion in the seminar portion of the class, and I, I think it's going to be really interesting. In terms of format, um, I will start, and Professor Abramson may jump in, um, or Professor Landsmark, asking the panelists some questions, and then we'll turn it over to you. So um, I think we've already seen in class that students are not shy about, you know, being pointed in their questions and and um, and and having maybe uh, uh, certain assertions or things they want to say. So we're encouraging everyone to do that. And for the uh, those who are online watching the live stream, we're going to be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, send them to the chat, and um, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, call on you through that. Um, so uh, John Harwood has been a distinguished journalist and political reporter for many years, um, has worked at the St. Pete Times, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, and then in his television incarnation um, at uh, CNBC, uh, NBC, and most recently CNN, um, where he was in the middle of uh, a lot of the discussions about whether coverage of Trump is too um, too critical or not. And he'll probably talk a little bit about that and some of the decisions he had to make. Um, Professor Abramson, as, as uh, Ted said, is a, um, uh, was editor of the New York Times, um, the 
you know, increasingly, I think, one of the central places where people get their news um, and has written about um, what's going on in the media. Um, her book, Merchants of Truth, um, looked at not just the Times, but also uh, startups, digital startups, including Vice. Erica Allen, to my left, is currently the uh, audience and engagement chief strategist. Is that kind of right? OK. Um, and and what, what she's really working on is the central question facing most media organizations, which is how to get more, uh, a greater audience, and especially a greater audience of people like you, of young people, um, to uh, engage with the news, to subscribe, to go through paywalls, and so forth. Um, she comes from Vice, uh, which was both initially a magazine, but then a digital platform with shows on HBO. So she's kind of, I guess, digital native is the, is the word to use. Um, but uh, again, I think speaks to a lot of the challenges that, uh, that the media uh, is dealing with. Uh, John Ellis um, has worked in kind of the political side of television um, for many years. Um, was also a columnist for The Globe at various points, but most recently, um, before he launched his own startup, was the head of the elections unit um, at Fox News. And obviously, Fox has become kind of a flashpoint in terms of its influence and its role. Um, and I, I think John has sort of special insight into that um, and can talk about how Fox has evolved and maybe his sense of the role that Fox plays now. Um, in the kind of media landscape. Um, and uh, Professor Landsmark, you already met. So um, why don't I kind of start it off by, um, by asking a variation of a question that, that Jill was asking when we were in class, which is that in 20, after 2016, after 2020, it felt to me like the media was having a nervous breakdown. Um, you know, how was it that we were so wrong about so many things, whether it was the polling that was wrong, whether it was the way in which uh, voters were uh, turning out was wrong. Uh, and most recently in 2020, groups that everyone thought were going to be democratic, like black men, um, like uh, Hispanics, actually were, you know, Trump was making more inroads and the election became uh, much more, much closer than we thought. And of course, the aftermath uh, much more tumultuous. So I'm wondering from your perspectives, um, has the media learned its lesson? Do you see ways in which things are going to be better this time? Um, or are we just destined for another repeat of kind of head scratching after it's all over and, and wondering where the media went wrong and that that affects the trust in media? So John, do you want to start out? Um, sure. Uh, I would say that I, I didn't share the nervous breakdown that um, Jonathan was talking about. I was wrong about what was going to happen in 2016 like everyone else. But I didn't see that as, um, you know, we're not uh, psychics. We, we, we don't predict the future. We, we try as best we can. It was a close election. And Trump uh, managed to get just enough votes in just the right places to win what had been a close election. You know, some people reacted to that by, you know, sending squadrons of reporters out to diners in Ohio to discover, well, what did we miss about um, white working class voters, for example. You know, I, I think it's, it's if, if, a, if a, a sports writer suggests in his coverage that one team's going to win the Super Bowl and the other one team, the other one wins, you know, that stuff happens. Um, and I also, I don't think that the coverage of Trump was that bad, even in 2016. Once we got past the phase in which he was treated uh, as a, a harmless uh, entertainer, I, actually, I think the most consequential um, media interaction that Trump had that built his candidacy uh, was when he had the Apprentice show, and that's what had a reached a very large audience. It, it propagated a view of Trump as a business person that uh, fundamentally wasn't accurate. Um, and in 2016, he kind of surfed on a lot of the um, resentments and anger that people had in reaction to Obama's election. Um, so have people learned their lesson about Trump coverage? I, I don't think so, and I, I'm not sure there was a uh, huge lesson to be 
learned. What I would say is, and I talked about this some in the last session, I think the coverage of Biden has been worse than the coverage of Trump, and I think the coverage of Hillary Clinton was worse than the coverage of Trump in 2016, principally because I think they um, did not put in proportion <clears throat> the things they were writing about uh, in the proper proportion. So I think Hillary Clinton's email issue was exaggerated way out of uh, its actual significance and importance. Um, and I think right now, uh, some of the coverage of uh, Biden has not accurately reflected the fact that he's run a successful administration. So, um, so I don't think too many lessons have been learned. Uh, I'm also not 100% convinced that it matters all that much, that press coverage itself matters all that much. Um, I think it matters some. I just don't know how uh, significant it was. You know, Trump got elected even though he had extremely critical coverage. Um, yeah, my dad in the 1970s was the first ombudsman in a major American newspaper. He was the Washington Post, the internal critic of the paper, and he was uh, trying to evaluate how the, the uh, press was covering Richard Nixon at a time when the Nixon administration was complaining the press was unfair. And he had a, did a public event one time uh, with uh, Pat Buchanan, who was an aide to, to Richard Nixon. And Buchanan um, was making the point that the press was this hugely powerful institution that was just hurting Nixon day after day. And Dad turned to Pat at one point and said, he just carried 49 states in the election. If we're so powerful, why did that happen? And, and trying to take him down, why'd that happen? So I, I think that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Joe? Yeah. I this is on? Okay. Uh, when Jonathan used the words nervous breakdown, uh, the ner nervous breakdown that I think was the most major came earlier than 2016 and didn't directly involve campaign politics. But the, the nervous breakdown in the news media came because the business model for supporting and financing the gathering of news collapsed uh, in the transition from in for newspapers from print to digital and the advertising terrain that supports cable TV and even network TV was undergoing huge changes so that the financial underpinnings of news media companies became very shaky. Uh, when I was managing editor of the Times, which is the second lead, most important leadership position, there were actually predictions in the press saying the Times would go bankrupt. Uh, and in some ways, the appearance of Donald Trump in 2016 in terms of business was very welcome because the audience for cable news programs grew and, you know, with that, advertising started to come back. Uh, and for newspapers, I mean, the, the adver advertising used to always be the primary source of revenue for newspapers, uh, especially in local papers, a type of advertising called classified ads, which are the, you know, dogs wanted, jobs wanted, I want to sell a couch kind of uh, little tombstone ads. And for the Washington Post, they brought in a fortune back in the day. Something ca quaint called Craigslist wiped out classified advertising almost overnight. And so Trump brought like a new sort of magnetism literally to the news reports of 
many news organizations, uh, especially cable TV and major national newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, which saw their digital circulation, people paying for their news online, leaped up. Uh, and I think that cre you know, created a kind of undercurrent of difficulty because you know if you were an editor thinking about modulating and having less coverage of Donald Trump you were going to bring in less readers less viewers and less money dems the facts so trump and the news media were and i think are in a very symbiotic relationship I feel that I have experienced many nervous breakdowns in my of di, of of the news media in my um, media career so far. Um, particularly from, you know, the digital perspective, it's like the, you know, I don't know that Facebook Live means anything to many people in this room, but pivot to video might. Um, so I think that there have been loads of moments of nervous breakdowns. Um, and I do think that that you know the Trump bump was a real thing, and that after it sort of went away, there was a moment of recognition that we needed to figure out what was going to happen um, across you know all of the companies that I've I've worked for. So I do think that if there's anything, any lesson learned, it is, and I'll speak on it from the audience perspective, it is that you have to sort of be able to tune into and think about, you know, in addition to the the things that everyone absolutely needs to read or watch or listen to in order to be an informed citizen, you also have to think about the things that people want to read and watch and listen to that can help to sustain a, a healthy, um, you know, news media organization. And I think that newsrooms are listening to their audiences more and thinking about their audiences more and appealing to um, you know the things that people want to to engage with more and I, so I do think that is a, a lesson that's learned. I don't know that, that it'll necessarily um, directly impact the way Trump is covered in this upcoming cycle. I mean I, I hope so but uh, but I, I do think that there are lessons that people have taken away from the the shaky ground that that many media organizations have found themselves in, um, as we, you know, as people have put up paywalls and and ad revenue has diminished. Um, so, you know, I think that the the nervous breakdowns continue and will continue, but I think that those are the things that challenge us and make us uh, sort of pivot not to video, but to you know the things that that will help to to serve our, our audience and our missions. I think the uh, going into this election cycle, I think that the news media <clears throat> writ large doesn't really know how to deal with Trump. I, th I said this at the earlier, earlier uh, seminar or whatever. Um, and so I think what's going to happen is that horse race coverage is going to dominate uh, over the next three, four, maybe five months uh, because being uncertain, because it rates, because it generates hits, there has to be a lot of Trump coverage. I'm not quite sure how to do it. And the safest way to do it is to do horse race. So I think that's what we're going to see a lot of. In terms of cable television, uh, the Fox News Channel, MSNBC, CNN get roughly 70% of their revenue from cable operators. So cable, we'll call it cable vision or optimum, whatever it's called now has, I think, 15 million uh, households, and they pay Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, X amount per month uh, to, carry that, to carry that program into those homes. So 70% comes out of s subscriber revenue, and 30% is advertising. And if the ratings are up by 2%, then the margins for the 
parent company are up by that amount. And what Trump did in 2015 and again in two, and throughout his presidency was he basically, for, for Fox News Channel, he basically doubled those numbers, uh, the ad numbers. So if, is Fox going to cover Trump night and day again? Absolutely. Uh, John, let me follow up because I think a lot of people would argue that Fox's impact not only on politics but on the media business has been profound. Um, we've had people from Fox come here and they say, well, you're criticizing us, but MSNBC now does the same thing. They've learned from us. Over giving us some perspective, I mean, what do you, can you give us a window into how Fox News operates and you know, the most common myths you hear about Fox News versus the reality as you've kind of seen it. Well, the reality, the, the reality of Fox News is that its power uh, is primarily a primetime phenomenon. They have a large following at night. Uh, the most watched program was Tucker Carlson, which I think was four million. The size of the electorate in 2020 was I think 158 million. Um, so Tucker was talking to people who already believed what he was telling them, and in fact, that's what they wanted to hear. So I've always thought that Fox's power, quote unquote, in terms of political, I thought it, it was basically people preaching to a choir, and that it didn't have that much impact because you know the people it was talking, people who were, uh, you know, for Biden weren't watching Fox News. Um, and Fox News' impact on what are called persuadable voters is de minimis. Um, so I, I always thought it was overrated. I always thought the real power in talk radio, what in Republican right-wing politics has always been talk radio. That's, that's been that way forever. Um, and I think that in terms of the impact that Fox has had on other cables is that the business model has basically been copied. So when, when, you know, Jill and I started at the NBC News election unit, there were bureaus in London and Tel Aviv and Paris and Los Angeles and Chicago and so on and so forth. And there was, there was a lot of emphasis put on the actual gathering of news. And at this point, uh, there is, I don't, I think Fox has a bureau in LA, a Washington bureau, and they might, I'm not sure they still do, but they might have a Tel Aviv bureau. That's it. They, the difference from when I started in the business, which was basically a lot of news coverage, some analysis, some commentary, not that much opinion. When I started, there were five columnists at the Boston Globe. I mean, at the uh, New York Times, maybe six if you count Russell Baker. Um, now, <clears throat> the, the proportions are probably 70% opinion uh, and the rest you know, commentary analysis and, and uh, coverage. And that's, that's the thing that Fox did that everybody copied um, because it printed money. Um, Erica, let me ask you, if, if, as the strategy person uh, and conversations you have with other parts of the newsroom, but if you could really like tell them what you really think, how would you redesign political coverage to bring in the audiences you're trying to attract, both maybe especially younger, uh, younger, a younger audience, but you know, what, what is it that you feel uh, newsrooms need to do to become part of this effort to keep people engaged with the news, to pay for the news, you know, all the things that newsrooms are struggling with? Well, I think, you know, part of what went wrong at some of the other places I've been at is that we went to, and did what we were trying to do on the platforms, um, you know, external platforms, Facebooks and things like that, instead of looking at the things that they, they are doing and that appeal to those audiences and bringing them into, into our ecosystems, right? So we saw that people are really engaged with short form video. I mean, I think that's a way that people want to consume information. It's accessible to them. We can do that. We don't have to go to other platforms to do that. So I think that thinking about the ways that 
we all use the internet and consume information on the internet as we sit down at our desks and um, or go out into the field and do our reporting and then bringing that into the, the, the journalism that we produce is one thing because that's the place where most people are consuming the journalism that we produce is on the internet. And if we remember how we behave, I think we'll, that's a pretty good um, you know, representation of our audience. Um, you know, and I think even things like brevity, right? People are busy. They want to be able to understand complicated things in ways that that they have time for. Um, so I think that that's another thing that, again, we can sort of take from some of the external platforms um, that we go out and, and produce work on. Uh, and bring that into into our report, and that's not to say that all all of our you know journalism and reporting should be short. Sometimes really really amazing in depth enterprise investigations and things like that. Like you do need space for it, um, but I think otherwise it's really about sort of picking up on the trends, the things that we see in the way that we all you know consume information and infusing those into the way that we we present our reporting. Um, I think that, you know, the people in, in the newsroom that I work in and the newsrooms I've worked in before, like do amazing world-class journalism. And some of it is something is just, sometimes it's just about sort of adapting the way we think about presenting that, that journalism. I think newsletters, for example, are, are an amazing um, vehicle for meeting people where they are, right? Everyone has to, at some point in their day, uh, check their email. Um, go into their inbox. So I think that's a, a great way to, to reach people. And, but then that means thinking about the ways people engage with things in their inbox in a different way than they do on their browser um, or in their, you know, cell phones or on a physical newspaper. So, um, I mean, there are loads of things that I'd love for people to, to think about, but it's not really about doing necessarily our journalism in a different way, I think it's really about considering the, the things that we need to do to make sure that that journalism um, resonates with people or feels accessible to people. I also think that the other thing that I, I tell everyone all the time, the, the main way that they can extend the reach of their, their reporting, um, political or not, is to, to think about who you're writing it for and, and try to make sure that you're sort of getting at what they want to know. Not necessarily the things that you as an expert think are the most important things, but the things that people really, really um, need to uh, understand how to live how to live their lives in, in the world. Yeah, you mentioned this idea of what does it mean to me? Yes, I think people are, you know, fundamentally pretty self-interested, right? So um, policy, right, we can talk, we can do the most most in-depth coverage of important policies, but if people don't have the takeaway, the thing that at the end of it, they understand how it's gonna impact them or their loved ones, their day to day, then I think we haven't, you know, it's not like mission accomplished for me, right? It's just, we've, we've given them information, but it's not resonant or relevant to them. So yeah, I think it's, it really comes down to like, what does it mean for me, what's the what's the me in this? Yeah, Jill, I noticed that you were tapping on uh, yeah, the cell I, phone down there. I, I was tapping on Jonathan's cell phone when uh, I'm probably, it, it reflects my age that I say cell phone. I, I was <laughs> tapping on Jonathan's cell and um, that was because, you know, Erica was making so many great points, but, you know, you, you read, I'm sure all of you have read uh, articles where people are declaring something a Gutenberg moment. You know, uh, you, you know, the printing press changed everything, changed society, and changed the way information traveled. Well, for me and the work I've done uh, on looking at the profound changes that have taken place in the news media over the past 15 years, this, when Steve Jobs introduced this in 2007, 
this was a Gutenberg moment. And all I can tell you is that the, at the Washington, at the New York Times, I don't think we we realized that, even, certainly not in real time, and not for possibly a year or two afterwards. Because what we thought, quote unquote, going digital was, was just basically taking the same things, same articles that were in the newspaper, and just putting them on different platforms, including this phone. But all the points Erica was making about people wanting the information maybe in shorter form, or they love to watch shorter video, that's because of this. And now, I think uh, what's, what's great, and I see it at the New York Times, I see it everywhere, is that people are doing journalism in ways that make the most of the various devices and places, or as John does in a newsletter. And they adapt the actual work to the platform. They're not just doing one size fits all news reports. Or make it specifically, or make it specifically for the platform because right. you know something, it's a huge percentage of people who read most of the Washington Post on their phone, right? But yet, oftentimes we come in, we sit down at our laptops and we think, oh, this is the place where people are are do, reading our, our journalism is on this laptop, because that's where I'm reading it right now. But really, when I leave my office, I read everything on my cell phone. And most people have that same behavior. I'm sure many people in this room have that same behavior. So I think that that's the thing, is really having that mobile first mindset, um, the, in addition to the digital first. Yes, there. Well, the app is now merged. Now we have one app, but it it there was a point where there was a a, a different app that was even more visual, and now that's brought and into the. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, let me just. I mean, one thing I want to add to what uh, Jill was talking about is that the, the iPhone's also a challenge for policymakers, right? It's not just how does media figure it out, but I remember being at an event, actually, the Washington Post. And um, uh, Dennis McDonough was there. He was like Obama's chief of staff. And he was talking afterwards, and he said, you know, if you're the president or you're in the White House and there's a terrorist attack or they behead someone and they put it out there, he said people are getting those pictures, you know, literally in the palm of their hand. It, it's kind of an invasiveness, which he said makes it difficult if you're a politician or a policymaker to deal with the emotions and all the other issues that are swirling around. So I think it's been transformative, not only in how we think of the news and, and sharing information, but how we make decisions, right? There's an immediacy to it, there's an urgency to it, and there's a, a frightening sometimes intimacy where everyone is looking at it, and I think if you're a manager in a company or the President of the United States trying to figure out how to respond to that, you've got to take into account kind of that factor, that sense of intimacy and proximity, which, which didn't exist. I, I just wanted to uh, add one point. Um, you know, Jill was talking about the challenge to the uh, business model of uh, cable television newspapers, and it's profound, and, and it's not been resolved at all. But I, I do think, to keep in perspective, we've all made our careers in, um, maybe not Erica, but uh, John and Jill and I have, in coverage of government and politics. But I, I think government politics has only one uh, small, uh, is only one small part of what's gonna be the business and profitability answer for newspapers. Things like Wordle or the, the New York Times food app or you know the crossword puzzle, all the all these other things that do answer the question: What does it mean to me? Um, you know, it's no accident that the you know 19 of the 20 highest-rated television shows in any given year are going to be NFL football games, uh, rather than public affairs shows or debates or whatever. Um, so I, I think while our 
professional lives are centered around politics. I think uh, we have a limited, um, we'll, we'll play a limited role in the um, uh, uh, maintenance of uh, profitability for news organizations that will sustain us over time. Uh, John, let me let me keep on you for a second. One of the issues that was coming up in our in the seminar portion of the conversation that I think was very interesting was this question of age. And um, you have very strong feelings about coverage of Biden and Biden's age, and that opened up a conversation, I think, a more general one, which is you know the frustration which many of you I suspect may share with these two old white guys kind of going at it and. Dianne Feinstein, Mitch McConnell. I mean, more and more, it's clear that the age of our politicians is affecting things. So kind of on both sides, could you talk a little bit about your feelings about coverage of Biden's age, and then more broadly about politically what's happening in this moment um, with, with so many politicians, it suddenly seems, dealing with these age-related questions? Um, well, a few things. Uh, obviously, there are uh, politicians who stay in office too long, and we're seeing some of them, and some uh, of their uh, uh, medical problems are playing out in a very high-profile way. Joe Biden is old. He's 80 years old. He doesn't talk the way that he used to as smoothly. A um, little bit of a stutter has come back, I think, uh, as president. He is not physically as uh, vibrant uh, as he used to be. Um, that being said, He's had a successful presidency so far, and I think there's no credible uh, evidence that he's not mentally all there. I think the uh, coverage of Joe Biden's age, it's kind of horse race driven and poll driven. So people take a poll and they say Biden's old, and so the press writes about that. But I think that's become a little bit of a, uh, uh, an excessively dominant theme of the coverage of Biden. The, the example most recently was um, Biden just did a around the world trip to India and Vietnam, which was the kind of trip that is extremely taxing for people of any age, any age. Um, and he was having meetings and going through the night and he had a press conference and he said something like, yeah, I want to go to bed. It is, it is bedtime, isn't it? Or something like that. And people treated that, that was treated Credibly in the New York Times as a reflection of the fact that he didn't know what was going on. Well, it's ridiculous. He'd been working the whole time, and the reporters were as tired as he was. And they all knew it. But because it, it fit into this uh, uh, poll-driven storyline, and, and, you know, I'm not saying there's not a, a real basis. He is old, uh, and that's not ideal. Uh, and many people would um, uh, would rather have a younger presidential candidate. However, he is the president. He's going to be the Democratic nominee. And so to me, to um, sort of beat that horse and kind of milk it in ways that may not be uh, reflective of reality or appropriate, I think is something that um, the press is doing a bit. And it's it's a little bit evocative of the exaggerated coverage of Hillary Clinton's emails in 2016, which were an issue, and it was a mistake that she made, and she uh, got some deserved criticism for it, but it, it became inflated into some potentially sinister or nefarious thing, which it obviously wasn't. Um, and so I, that, that is some of my feeling about the current um, age discussion. Eric, what about what's your feeling, but also more broadly, looking at the media and politics? Is, do we have an age problem in this country? Or about is it a disconnect? In the media. <laughs> I, I think that there is a huge number of young voters that would like to see people who look more like them and have closer experience to the experience that they're having. And I think that's just a fact, and that it is a problem that those people don't have as much of a shot, a chance, an opportunity to, to rise to the levels of power where they would have the influence to be able to, you know, 
serve those people who feel like they would be better represented by people who are closer to their age. So yes, I think that there are, there should be more opportunities for younger people to be in, in positions of political power, because I think there are a lot of young people who don't feel represented by the by the older elected officials. Do you think that's true the big media? Oh, wait, wait, do you think? There's a whole bunch of people younger than Joe Biden living in the Senate in 2020, and they lost. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's true? Yes, and they that they also need the support of the party, I would say. I mean, do you think in the media that same thing is true? Do you feel the boomers are hanging on in a way that they shouldn't? God knows they're doing it at universities. I have been r really, I've worked at a lot of youth media organizations. I put that a little bit in, in air quotes, right? Where there are, there are um, a lot of people who are millennials, Gen Z, people who are in, um, in senior leadership positions and have empowered people who are about their age, younger, a little bit older. Um, and that's really been awesome for me and exciting. Um, I think that at some of the more you know, print-based traditional legacy organizations, sure, there, there are people who have had long careers I think that they have also a huge amount of expertise and um, and I think that they can and should be able to adapt to the digital native ecosystem. I, so, absolutely. Um, but I, and I do, th and I feel fortunate to work with a lot of uh, young people at the Post right now who are really smart and have been given opportunities to be in, in um, positions of power and have influence in the newsroom. I mean, most audience teams are often composed of young, digitally native um, people who grew up reading news on the internet. Um, so that's my experience right now. And, and at other places, it's been a little bit more like millennial heavy. Um, but I, th I think that, of course, the leadership of th these organizations impacts the priorities the same way the leadership in, in um, Congress impacts the, the priorities. Um, John, I wanted to switch a little bit and ask you to talk about your own experience, because you're involved in two things, which Erica identified as areas where um, are very effective in attracting um, a younger audience, but maybe a more engaged audience, which are newsletters and podcasts. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what your sense of that is and kind of how it's worked for you, but also what it says about what the media landscape is going to be going forward. There's a uh, famous uh, essay written by, um, ooh, I can't remember his name, uh, but it was called A Thousand True Fans. Um, and the idea was that in this internet age, if you had a thousand people who subscribe to your, whatever it was, your songs or your poems or your pictures or your blog, um, and you got them to pay $75 a year for the privilege, then you had $75,000, which was a working wage in most of the country, and that that enabled all these people to go out and do what they really love to do, um, and, and make a living of it. Um, that could have been the uh, pitch deck for a company called Substack, which provides for people like me the basic infrastructure for putting out a newsletter and all the financial back end. Uh, they take between Substack and Stripe, which is the digital payments provider, they take 14% of the cut, um, and you, I, get to keep the rest. Um, and the thing about when I started with Substack, which was 2019, uh, there weren't very many of us on the platform, um, and so you were able to sort of stand out. Now there are literally tens of thousands of people who have Substacks, and it's hard to stand out. News items and political news items together have about 4,500, 4,350, something These are like your that. Newsletters. 
Uh, my newsletters uh, have about 4,300, 4,500 uh, subscribers. And uh, our, my idea of them is that there is a lot of really, really important news happening in the world. I think that artificial intelligence and synthetic, synthetic biology are the two most uh, important subjects like in the history of mankind. And so I've sort of organized the newsletter around not just <clears throat> politics and geopolitics, but the financialization of everything, science and technology at the edge, and then a world, as you no doubt know from reading the papers and, and looking at the internet, a world in disarray. And that, for me, I put out a product that uh, for my audience, they may not be able to scan all of those sources. We scan about 60 to 75 sources a day, uh, and we put it into a sort of a 20-point or 15-point newsletter, which we get out by 6.45 every morning. Uh, that gives somebody pretty much, they, in eight minutes, they'll pretty much know what we think are the most serious news stories around. Um, and it's a working, it's a workable model. The problem for us is that artificial intelligence is going to take take us out. Um, so we probably have another five years. Uh, my view of of the AI people is that they should put write checks to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Economist, uh, Asia Nikkei, FT. Just write 250 million dollar checks. Say, you are our newsroom, and then they can do newsletters that are specific to every person that's interested in whatever subject they're interested in. Um, and I think that's, there, some version of that is gonna happen. Uh, and that is the future of news, and then I'm out of business. So. <laughs> Um, we're going to open it up to your questions, so you may want to start thinking about um, what you want to ask. Ted, do you have something you want to ask the panel before we turn it over? Okay. Ted says, let's go to them. So uh, can you raise your hand? We'll find you with a, uh, with a microphone, and uh, if there's anything from the uh, live stream audience, we can do it. So questions? Um, just relative to the AI thing that you just said, um, I was wondering, do you think that would create uh, more of this uh, like sensationalization bias of people where if they say, I'm only interested in this, that's the only news that they get? Uh, do you think if, if like AI companies or, or if places start to cater to only what people are interested in news-wise, do you think that would create some sort of bias in terms of algorithm or, or whatever that would have people only see what they would like to see? Increase the silos? Kind of yeah. I think, yeah. I think there would be uh, siloing for sure, but I, I, I also think that there's a general you know, interest in news, right? Um, and I think that the AI product drawing from as many sources as it will uh, would probably be, you know, if, I mean, if you had the newsrooms of eight great publications uh, being the provider of the news, that's going to be a good news report. And then if you want to go deeper into whatever the subject is, they can provide you with, uh, with that newsletter. They do it now, but it's not nearly as good as it could be. And as AI gets smarter and smarter and smarter, it's going to be able to make it much, much better, much better than I can do it, that's for sure. So, I, I, can you hear me? Yes. I, I want to go back to the question that uh, Jonathan asked at the very beginning uh, about the uh, existence or lack thereof of a nervous breakdown. Uh, about where we are now. Jeremy, you want to just briefly identify yourself? Yeah, I'm Jeremy Paul. I teach at the law school. Um, and, and I find, I've actually found this panel alarming uh, in the sense that you don't seem to be having a nervous breakdown, and I think you all should be. And the reason why I think you should be is, is, is that um, I understand that there's a lot to talk about as to how the media organizations can make money, tackle the business model. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have a mission. And the mission is to inform the public. And at the current moment, 40% of the country thinks that the 2020 election was stolen, even though right, uh, Donald Trump lost 63 court cases. 
He had millions and millions of dollars to investigate the, the, the race. Uh, the head of the election security uh, group that he appointed said it was the most safest election uh, in the history of the country. Right? So the media is not succeeding in informing the public in a way that is convincing the public of what actually happened. Right? So from my point of view, it's failing. Now, you, a typical media response would be, well, we, you know, CNN is out there and MSNBC and the New York Times, and we're telling people, um, and if they don't believe us, that's not our problem. But I think it is your problem. And I think that, that, that uh, you, the media in general doesn't want to be in a fight with the, with the quote unquote other side because then it's being politicized. But you lost that already. And, and right now that we're in this moment in which one of our political parties is trying to discredit the media day in and day out, uh, they're in a fight and your position is, I don't want to fight. So you're losing, and, and therefore you ought to be in a, having a nervous breakdown. And nobody talked about that. John, do you want to, having been in the middle of one of those fights? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't agree that the fact that 40% of the country uh, thinks the election was stolen is because the media has not told that story. I think that has a lot more to do with the fact that there is a segment of the country that uh, feels that the country that they have assumed was theirs is being taken away from them, is, is uh, that, that the, you know, we're talking essentially about conservative white Christians uh, who thought, who for most of our history were the majority of the country, now they're not. And they, uh, for them, um, uh, an appropriate election is one where their um, side is on top, and they're not inclined to believe that they're not that it's not their country anymore. And I think that's that's what it's about. And I don't think that's uh, because the media hasn't told the truth about that. I think it's because they're not receptive to the truth. And I'm not sure how you can make people who don't want to believe what you're saying believe it. I, I don't know how you do that. That's it. That's the only problem. You've got to figure out how to get people to believe the truth. That's why they don't need it. I mean, no one is going to dispute what you just said, but how you do that is unbelievably co complicated, not just in terms of how you spread the truth, but the way that technology has changed the consumption of news means, I mean, I ran the New York Times, you know, day after day, we would publish what was the truth. We knew it was the truth. The problem is that the readership for the Times probably already agrees with that truth. The audience, you know, we have come so far from, you know, the, the way I grew up when people would gather every night and everyone got their news from Walter Cronkite on CBS Evening News. It was a mass audience for one news organization and everything is kind of siloed now. Even, you know, a, a very large news institution like the Times, which now has, you know, more than 10 million paying subscribers, you're still reaching mainly cities, mainly coastal cities, mainly college educated people, mostly pretty affluent people. And so, you know, sort of playing the role of providing this unitary truth to the unitary people, it's just, it's almost impossible now. It just, it just is. It's is regrettable, it? it's bad for democracy, but it's the way it is. But, but why is it that uh, the conservative media um, who may not represent the majority of, of the uh, American population, why is it 
that they, with their AM outlets and, and uh, right-wing uh, programming, have prevailed in terms of policy making. I mean, I think it's a great question. And I, I think it's something that has its roots probably going back to the 1980s. And because my sense is, if you go back to the 80s, I mean, that whole thing about Democrats want to govern and Republicans want to win. I mean, I think that there was a lot of truth in that. And I think, you know, John said earlier, so just on the media question, we had someone in from Fox News. And whenever he comes in, he always starts out by saying, when those of you who are journalism students go to your jobs, you'll be meeting at 10 a.m. in a news meeting and be deciding what do our readers, what should our audience know about? What do they need to know about? What should we tell them? And he said at Fox, and this is something John also talked about, the meetings go on and it's what does our audience want? And John had a great way to put it earlier, which is if people think Fox drives the audience, but in fact, it's the audience drives Fox. And there was no clearer example of that than in the Dominion case, where it was clear that Murdoch, for sure, I think, wanted to back away from Trump, wanted to end that relationship, and ratings plummeted, so they kind of went all in. Um, I think you're right, Jeremy, that we've got to be thinking better about how you reach people. And clearly, one of the things that's happening is that politics has become almost like a religion. You know, it's sort of like in the Middle Ages going to the Pope and saying, how can we persuade the Protestants? You know, I mean, it, it wasn't, I mean, that just wasn't going to happen. And it, it still hasn't happened. The other thing is, I think the media, as much as we like to, or we used to like to think of ourselves as the arbiters of truth and having this influence, we need other people to support these positions, right? We don't control everything. And so in a situation like we're in now or around January 6th, you know, the fact that Republicans have not stood up, um, you know, in any kind of a leadership role, you know, except for maybe um, Liz Cheney, I think makes it hard. Our role, I mean, we are not in charge, right? And, and maybe there are ways in which we can expose people to arguments. I think the New York Times is trying to do that by hiring and running all sorts of, you know, more conservative uh, points of view. But I think, as Jill says, a lot of that is kind of to educate their already liberal readers. Um, but I, I think part of the problem is that the other segments of society, most notably the Republican Party, has no interest in kind of working with the media or picking up some of those messages. And if anything, it feels like the right-wing ecosystem of media, dark money, politicians is very much in lockstep. And do progressives, liberals, Democrats want to enforce that lockstep and say, don't you dare raise Joe Biden's age? You know, don't you dare try to address you know, complicated issues? It just always has felt to me that Democrats, we're not, Democrats are not built that way. And neither is the media. You know, we're not kind of ideologically driven and don't, don't bother us with the complexities of things. And we seem to be in an age where there's no response. I, I think Democrats, liberals, progressives, the media are having a hard time dealing with this new landscape. And I think then you layer on top of that algorithms, right? And and the the walls that put are put up around and the echo chambers that are created on on the platforms where people are consuming their news and that just reinforces it. So uh, John? Sure. Just to get back to the point that you raised, I don't think it's about information. I think it's about people's sense of their interests and and those uh, the strength of those feelings, which you know Jonathan likened it to religious feeling, can be impervious to information. You know, white Southerners didn't resist uh, civil rights legislation for decades and decades because. They didn't know what the Constitution said, or they didn't know that the Supreme Court had ruled in Brown v. Board of Education, or whatever. It's because they thought they were defending uh, what they thought was the important uh, elements of their way of life, and it's not about um, it's not about not knowing things. It's about this is what we want, and we're going to defend it. And 
I, I, I don't know how a, a newspaper or a television station, I mean, that was finally overcome in a unique set of circumstances that came together that involved the civil rights movement provoking violent uh, 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 incidents that once shown on television um, created a political movement that in combination with, you know, the assassination of a democratic president and the, the uh, sort of ca things came together at a moment where decades of resistance was overcome. But it wasn't really overcome by information. It was by, it was by um, events that occurred in the world that sort of uh, changed, um, changed the political configuration just enough to make things different. And in, in this case, I think what is likeliest to uh, change the behavior of, say, the Republican Party is to lose over and over again. And if they lose over and over again, they will uh, decide that their interests are served by changing. And I, I, I don't think there's a shortcut around that. Uh, hello there. Um, I was just curious about, yeah, um, about almost 30% or 30% of Americans didn't turn out to vote uh, in the last three elections, including the uh, two midterms. I was curious, do you think there's a way, I mean, you talked about a little bit about like, what is it that affects them? Um, you know, you'd think that COVID would make, it would be about the most thing that could affect them the most. How do you reach those people? And how do you look at their readership um, in rel rel relative to your other readers who are you know, maybe active every day? I don't think that there's a, a singular answer. I think that it is something that I know I think about uh, every day. <laughs> um, but I think it's I think it's challenging. I do think it's about reaching meeting people where they are, right? Trying to find the things that that f find the ways, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or whatever it is that you can deliver information, news information to people in places where they already are instead of expecting them to come to you and register and get behind a paywall and things like that. So I think that there are important conversations to be had about what sort of service journalism is available to people in those in those ways and the ways that we can make them accessible and informative. Um, I mean, I think that's really, to me, the thing that I think about is how we can meet people where they are and, in, and encourage them and make them understand um, with facts and reporting the things that matter to them and that they do have influence. I also think there's a huge just amount of fatigue, right? There is, we are constantly inundated with terrible information. Terrible things are happening all around us all the time. And I think it's very easy for people to tune out of that. And I think it is our responsibility and our, is our mission to try to figure out the ways that we can bring them into the conversation. But I think that's about going to, going to where they are and figuring out the, the, opportunities to um, to show that like they can have an Im impact right in by engaging and being informed um, you know registering to vote whatever it is uh, what, what do we know about the demographics of uh, users of TikTok and Instagram younger to be sure but I mean, uh, are, are, are we reaching immigrant populations? Are we reaching populations that are traditionally underserved by uh, mainstream media? I think that's also a really important question and also a place where AI can play a huge role. I mean, newsrooms have, you know, the New York Times had a Spanish language effort that doesn't exist anymore. The Washington Post um, had some, had El Post and things that were done in, in, other languages to be able to reach other communities, non-English speakers. I mean, I think to me that AI, there's so much potential for AI to be used to translate 
strong journalism in ways that other people will be, you know, non-English speakers will be able to, to understand them. I do think that those populations are on TikTok and they're watching things in, in the ways that are accessible and, and understandable for them. And, you know, we need to be there to meet them um, in those spaces when we can. about getting people to vote is the one thing people forget about voting is that if you're a Republican in California, there's no point in voting uh, at the statewide level. You're going to lose, so why bother, right? If you're a Republican uh, in New York State, you know, forget it. It's not going to happen. So a lot of people, I think, don't vote because what's the point, right? I mean, if I live in Connecticut, Mike my congressman who's a good congressman is a democrat if i if i you know if i wanted to vote republican against him it would be pointless because he's going to win he's going to get 62 or 66 percent um the only place where a statewide race is competitive is a governor's race um, so i think that's a large part of why people don't vote is because you know what's the point um yeah hi it's me again <clears throat> So um, I'm running off two assumptions with this question. Um, first, that media's job is not to convince the public, but to inform them. And then the second assumption would be that journalists do have a moral obligation when they report um, to be truthful, to properly inform, et cetera. Um, so for all of you guys, looking at journalism as both a business and a profession where you inform, how do you kind of get out of that circular kind of reasoning between um, informing properly and informing in a way that will catch readers' attention without, you know, clickbaiting them, like we were kind of saying earlier? So how do you get through that circular reasoning of inform properly but appeal, but you have to inform properly? You know, it just kind of keeps going. I mean, I think part of the issue is you know, I think anybody who was in a newsroom up till maybe 20 years ago, there was kind of an arrogance and a swagger to it, right? We know what the story is. If you don't like it, write a letter. You know, that was kind of the, the way the world worked. And as Jill was saying, that, I mean, this country for, you know, easily 50 years after the war, um, it was three networks told you everything and probably three newspapers. Um, and I think what we've discovered is not only was technology kind of disruptive, but it also put us suddenly a lot closer to readers and viewers and listeners. So, you know, as I'd said earlier in, in, in class, if you go to the Washington Post, the CNN, any newsroom in the country, there are these monitors everywhere that tell you in real time who's clicking on what, you know, who's getting the most hits. So you're suddenly seeing that. I think also that, that part of the you know, issue facing the media is that certainly after Watergate, I mean, Watergate, I think, was really seminal in part because it suddenly attracted a whole generation of journalists who could have done something else, right? They would have become lawyers, they would have worked in government, you know, they would have done something else. And they went into journalism because based on Watergate, it was seen as something, and the Vietnam reporting, you know, you could hold government accountable, you could do well financially, and you could do good. I think what, what 2016 did was suddenly shatter this notion that we knew what the country was like. I mean, there were so many journalists who came to speak here or who, you know, I think we all got to know who would say, I don't know anybody who voted for Trump, you know. I, and, and, you know, we had people speaking here where they would go home on vacation to Michigan or New Hampshire. And, you know, Aunt Betsy, who hadn't voted in an election ever, was going to vote for Donald Trump. And they would come back to the newsroom and say to their editors, you know, I think we got to figure this out. And they would say, well, no, no, the polls show Hillary's going to win, you know, win by a lot. And so I, I think part of what's gone on in newsrooms is not, is that one of the things newsrooms have to deal with is not just a racial reckoning that there's been a lot of talk about and objectivity, but also kind of an elitist reckoning, which is that, you know, most people in the major newsrooms, you know, tend to come from backgrounds where they've gone to, you know, the quote unquote good colleges. They've grown up often in suburban or urban cosmopolitan environments. And because of the collapse of local news, no one spends three years in Texas 
covering school boards or time in South Dakota, you know, learning how to talk to firefighters or, or factory workers. So I, I think that, that, that part of what's going on with the media is that we fear, I mean, I certainly fear, that we become disconnected from whole parts of the country. And, you know, I think to Jeremy's point, I, I think and that was behind, I think, the effort of a lot of big news organizations to figure out how do we cover red states. And, and then the other thing I would say is that this is not just a US phenomenon. You know, it, it's, it's, it's going on in Poland, it's going on in Hungary, it's going on in Israel, it's going on in, in Brazil. I mean, the, the rise of populism and the weaponizing of making the media a target really pays off. And I think a lot of people were surprised when Trump won, they thought, oh, well, he's won, so now he'll be kind of all, he'll act presidential, right? And you know he's going to meet with the editors of the New York Times, and he did, and he was kind of needling them. And I, I think Trump understood something that attacking the media was something Nixon understood. You know that attacking the media is effective if you're trying to create a certain kind of regime. Um, so I, I think all those things are kind of part of what the the nervous breakdown that I kind of mentioned is is kind of part of. So the solution to that and navigating it. I mean, I know, Erica, you're probably the best positioned. I mean, you've been in different places, some upstarts, some legacy ones trying to reform. How do you think that you or news organizations can navigate this kind of new world? I guess I, th I, I, guess I don't see a binary between doing the mission of, of informing people and giving people information that they want to en engage with. I don't I think that those things I think we're not doing one without the other, right? If people aren't reading your journalism, you're not accomplishing your mission. Um, I guess I think the other part of it is like not trying to be everything to everyone, right? We have so much choice. I think local news is really, really important for the reasons that you spoke about, right? That like the 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 school board coverage is important, but it can't be done by by everyone and we need to prop up the places that can do it and can do it well and then do the journalism that we can do well. And I think that's the same. I think, you know, Vice appealed to a very specific audience and tried to do the journalism that they knew was important to those people. And the Times does the same for their audience and the Post does the same for its. So, you know, I think it is. I think it is a challenge. I think we're all figuring it out all all the time. But I don't think that it's a. It's an either or. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. A wonderful, wonderful session. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in 2024, but I do know that in, in 2028, uh, the cult of Donald Trump will be over, and if Biden wins next year, he will not be a candidate for a third term. I don't think either party has thought ahead. It's not that far away, five years. And I don't think journalism has thought ahead. I think the, the, the mania that defines our lives today hopefully will be a thing of the past in 2028. We all have to prepare for it. And I think the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, their chances of prevailing next year would be improved if they evinced an awareness that the mania of the current day will pass. What would you suggest they do? Um, I certainly don't think that I'm qualified in the least to prescribe what they should do, but I think it would be very helpful if they acknowledge the issue. And they're not. There's no discussion about, you know, the United States was founded in 1776. We've been at it a long time. The current craziness, and I think we are in, in the grip of a, of a crazy time, will pass inevitably and, and indisputably in 2028. And I think it would be very helpful to the country and to each party if they acknowledge that and they began to think about what happens after. I, I wish I could have faith that everything changes in 2028. I'll just make the point, one thing that is very unlikely to change is the US Supreme Court, a whole branch of our government where the justices have lifetime tenure. And we now have a 6-3 majority of extremely conservative 
justices who really express, I think, in many of their decisions, and Dobbs is just one, uh, decisions that run counter to what the majority of the population says they want. But we'll see. Guns, so-called religious liberty, affirmative action, uh, abortion, they were right there. <laughs> John, you wanna? Well, I was just gonna say, I, I think that, um, a couple points. One, I think, what I think you're alluding to about the current mania um, is gonna be with us for a long time because we're in a long-term transition to becoming a majority minority country. Uh, and that is very unsettling to a significant group of people. And in fact, what Jill was just saying is the fact that we have an entrenched conservative majority on the court that is not attuned to that new, that rising majority is gonna create uh, pressure points for, for quite a long time. Secondly, the parties don't really exist as um, as forces to present a front one way or the other. The you have a president who is the leader of his party, and he uh, sets the tone for his administration and works with his party to get stuff done. When Biden's gone, there's going to be a ton of uh, new, younger Democratic politicians who are going to be fighting for the uh, mantle going forward, as will happen in the Republican Party uh, under Trump. So I think preparing for the future is something that Gretchen Whitmer and Pete Buttigieg and Gavin Newsom, they're doing that right now. It's just that it's not their, it's not their ball. It's Joe Biden's ball. And so uh, once he's gone, then those concerns and those constituencies are going to be very vocally represented, and the same thing is true in the Republican side. Hey there. Um, so I think most of you have acknowledged that uh, there's currently a marriage between the business side of things and uh, the institutions that you guys represent. Um, at the end of the day, the board of directors is going to be concerned more about the bottom line than about the product that's put out. Um, and I think that's really the fundamental problem that a lot of young people have with, you know, what we see from media today. Um, I'm realizing this isn't so much of a question now and more of just commentary. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just kind of reflects our frustrations of where we're at. I mean, Jill, was in, you've been involved and in clashed as the times evolve and the business side took more interest in what was going on. I think, John, so have you. Eric, I don't know what things are like at the Post. Um, John, you said your goal in life was to have no one above you and no one below you, so you've maybe kind of <laughs> escaped that now. But, but you work for Rupert Murdoch. So, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the interplay? You know, there's the view of, like, how these things happen in some theoretical way. But I think concretely in all your careers, how is it played out and where do you see well, let me just make a couple points about what, what you observed. Um, in my career, uh, I have, for the most part, had the luxury of not caring and not having my bosses care about the bottom line for the reason that the journalism business that I came into, as Jonathan was explaining, um, had sort of monopoly control over over the information dissemination in their markets. The, uh, the local newspaper dominated. That was where you could put your classified ads. They made money that way. And the, how, how aggressively they uh, performed the co public service component mm -hmm. of their um, journalism mission was a function of the benevolence of the owner. And so uh, I worked for the paper I started uh, working for was um, had a very benevolent owner who put a ton of money into news gathering. Um, 
The Washington Post, which is where my father worked, the Graham family, was uh, uh, very much committed uh, to journalism. And I, and I think the Post is very fortunate right now to have a very wealthy owner who, you know, he doesn't have unlimited patience, I'm sure, with business troubles at the paper, but there's a lot of running room. And so it sort of depends on where you work. Like some news organizations are much more focused on the bottom line than others. And I think it's not an accident that we're seeing some nonprofit sites that are being developed. ProPublica, for example, has done a lot of great work uh, on Supreme Court and other issues um, that has raised money from donors to do that journalism. So um, I'm glad that I'm not starting my career in, in a place where so much of the media landscape has to worry constantly about the bottom line. I, I didn't have to do that, and I'm very happy that smart people like Erica are, are trying to figure out a way to square that circle. Uh, you know, the, it, it's not a binary between public service and the bottom line, but there are trade-offs involved, and, and you need people um, whose values are good and whose commitment to the mission of journalism is sufficient to... Um, sort of drive that as far as you can in, in, in the direction of public service. But I, your point's well taken. Yeah, I think a, a, another issue that is, is related, I think what you were asking about is the whole issue of the, the can you trust the corporate media? Um, and that cynicism about the corporate media, I think, is somewhat pervasive among, you know, younger consumers of news. And it's a, a real thing. Uh, I just point out that, you know, there, there's there been, to me, because uh, I, <clears throat> I actually fought against the dominance of the business side of the Times over the news side when I was managing editor and executive editor. Um, but what what I, I came to be surprised at is I fought, you know, all of these battles that I thought were very important battles of principle. But the surprise is there have been so relatively few scandals involving the news being tainted by you know bowing to advertisers or for money making purposes, and you know I look back now because the Times has had zero that you know I was fighting these huge battles, worrying about, and still they could happen, but worrying about things that just never happened and you know some of them i look back on as being overblown or even silly in some sense and you know in terms of the corporate media i think you know the the worry right now is that ai which is training you know, chat GPT and every other form of AI by using, you know, all of the news and content that places like the New York Times or the Post or CNN have gone at to tremendous expense to produce. Uh, news gathering is incredibly expensive. And right now, you know, there are copyright laws that do protect ownership of that content. But right now, the people at Microsoft who are do doing ChatGPT and anybody else, they're, you know, they're using for free this material as chum to make AI better and better. And right now, you know, there's a consortium of the corporate, the, the evil corporate media to try and figure out a way that they don't end up going out of business. That's a, that's a, uh, 
one of the one of the things that I think that's sort of underreported is, you know, we, we have a there's been a lot of talk about income inequality and meritocracy, you know, divisions of of um, the amount of education you've had and so on and so forth. But we're now at the edge of a time when the people who know how to write code and the people who know how to decipher genetic code are going to be enormously powerful, more powerful than nation states, more powerful than media operations, more powerful than financial institutions. They're going to be the single most powerful forces in society around the world. And that you know, that, that is part of journalism's crisis is that what it's doing is just making AI better and stronger. Um, that they're basically digging their own grave. Mm -hmm. um, John, can I just ask you though to respond in this corporate media sense, um, and I'll come back to you, Erica. Um, about, I mean, you worked for, you know, the villain in the James Bond movie, right? I mean, the, all the fears of corporate media, control and so forth are, you know, kind of symbolized by Murdoch. Was it as bad as people think, or was it fine, or what? How did it play out? What, what was Murdoch? I mean, working for Murdoch and Murdoch's influence over the newsroom. Well, uh, working for Rupert on the stuff, I did special projects for Rupert. We looked at partnerships. Uh, we were talking about a major partnership between the Wall Street Journal and MIT. Um, so that part, the Wall Street Journal part, the News Corp part was not, I don't think, much different than working uh, for the New York Times or the Washington Post. Uh, on the Fox News side, the, Rupert sold the entertainment assets of, of the Fox Corporation to Disney, and they reorganized the company, and they re, it was called 21st Century Fox, and they, it's now called Fox Corporation. So lose all the entertainment assets, reorganize the company, is now Fox Corporation. Fox News provides 90% of the pre-tax profit of the Fox Corporation. So when, you know, when Rupert Murdoch looks at Fox News, he says, okay, this is 90% of our profit. So it better stay that way or my stock price is going to go down. And how does that express itself? Don't get crosswise with the audience. That, you know, I, I say this over and over again. Fox News does not program the audience. The audience programs the network. And if you, if, if as long as the network is not crosswise with the audience, then the ratings will hold, the revenues, the advertising revenues will stay steady. You want to bring us some optimism? Yes, actually, I do. I do want to bring some optimism because I have worked at some VC-backed media organizations, some of which no longer exist for the very reasons that, that you sort of get at. I don't think that that applies to, you know, it definitely doesn't apply to the New York Times and the Washington Post, where I do think that there are owners and business people who are very, very invested in the mission, right? They come to work at a journalism organization because they believe in that mission. I do think that there is an interesting backlash happening right now to the VC funded media trend that has been happening. And I think it's worker owned media organizations like Defector and 404 and many others that are starting up and starting their own small newsrooms where they own, own the business and they do the journalism that they think is important and they have subscribers that they appeal to directly and they are trying to self-fund and do important work that is removed from the venture capital machine. And I think that it's important that we, you know, support those organizations. Um, okay, this has been great. Uh, we've reached our time limit. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming and I especially want to thank the panel um, for a really candid and I think uh, far-reaching conversation. So thank you all. We'll be, we'll, be back, we'll be back next week talking about the political landscape. Uh, Ted, any final words? So thank you all.